On this episode of AV Week, we take a look at developing a contingency and backup plan in case of a disaster and debating bespoke versus one size fits all AV. All that and more next on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is AV Week, episode 420, recorded Friday, September 6th, 2019. Rapid AV. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Peerless AV, driving technology through innovation. And by Buy-In. And by FSR. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audio, visual, news, and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host with us to discuss the news and information we have got this week. First and foremost, my buddy and pal and uh, AV uh, uh, guru extraordinaire, Mr. Brock McGinnis. How are you, sir? I am well, and uh, thank you for having me on again, Tim. It's been far too long. Absolutely. absolutely. And I, I, we will point out, if you're not watching the video, Brock McGinnis's fancy schmancy AV in the AM uh, a shirt or jacket. You can actually buy those now. So you can get a hold of this other one on Twitter. Uh, also with us is uh, Cassie Berger. Cassie is from Sure up in Chicago. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Absolutely. absolutely. And last but not least, uh, Jim Jaquetta uh, from Vidovation. Jim uh, and I uh, connected right before Infocom actually this year. Uh, so welcome, Jim. How are you, sir? How are you, Tim? Thank you for having me. Good to be here. We are recording this on Friday, the 6th of September. As we're recording this, uh, Hurricane Dorian is making its way up the east coast of the United States. I believe currently the last report I had was that it's uh, it's right around the, the, the South Carolina, North Carolina um, area. The reason I bring this up is as you were watching this, and, and the Bahamas got absolutely decimated. Uh, parts of, of, of Florida were, were affected, uh, parts of Georgia, and, and on, on up the coast. As I'm watching this and, and actually talking with, with some, some folks in the industry that are, that are being impacted by this, uh, one of the things that was, was, we were talking about uh, were the number of systems that were in, being impacted, both you know, audiovisual as well as electrical and, and other systems such as a cell phone and, and emergency notification system. That led me to ask the question here is, is what can we do uh, in the AV industry to protect ourselves, to get ourselves ready? Um, whether it's a hurricane, which is which is probably one of the worst natural disasters that somebody is going to uh, be affected by, or maybe something lesser. You know, you were talking about you know uh, large amounts of rain, we, we live events and stuff like that. Brock, I'm going to start with you on this because you, you must worry. Not only does obviously some pretty uh, impressive installs, but you also do a number of, of live events uh, in, the, in the Toronto area and beyond. What are some of the ways that we can protect ourselves and, and, and protect our, our customers as we're looking at contingencies, uh, you know, acts of God? Um, weather's terrifying uh, because it, uh, it's the one element that we really can't control. And so all you can do is protect and prevent against those things that, that you can. Um, our live events uh, teams, uh, when they're rigging outdoor stages for festivals, uh, we have mobile trucks, uh, mobile stages, uh, they are incredibly safety conscious and uh, more so and more so all the time because of the number of tragic accidents that have occurred within the industry. Um, and, and so it, it's a case of if you, you know, if you think you need a couple of hundred pounds of water uh, on the end of every rope that's holding a tent or something, uh, make it 500 pounds because uh, it, it, it's really all that you can do. Um, the, uh, uh, there are some, some very important AV people that will have been involved uh, in the Dorian storm and others, uh, people manning emergency operations centers uh, and, uh, and the technology that has been involved uh, at NASA, at other agencies. I am in awe of those people um, uh, and, uh, and the efforts that they put in. When, uh, when water's coming in your uh, second floor windows, Nobody cares about the TV. <laughs> Nobody cares about AV. Um, but uh, but 
uh, our emergency operations brethren and the folks in the industry that specialize in ensuring those systems are up and running, that have uh, multiple uh, layers and levels of connectivity uh, to video, to internet, uh, to uh, satellite communication. My hat's off to them. They've had a heck of a week. Uh, Jim, uh, same kind of question to you, and, and Bitovation not only does with commercial AV, but also with broadcast. Take it from both sides of that, and, and what we can do, and what. Yeah, you in in the uh, I can think of an example, uh, several examples in the uh, more uh, AV space. We we do a lot of work uh, building uh, in-house IPTV systems, television distribution systems, digital signage systems. We just finished uh, last week an installation at uh, Paramount Pictures, uh, lighting up their whole lot with, with a direct TV, moving stage feeds around the campus. And uh, we have a secondary phase to the system where we're gonna integrate EAS or emergency alert system. So uh, maybe more of a preventative uh, uh, measure to, you know, so people can evacuate a facility, a public facility uh, nowadays, uh, every uh, management company, building owner, landlord, um, they're all concerned of an active shooter on campus. What do we do? What are the procedures? So the, uh, the television system can be an important piece of, of alerting the general public or alerting your, uh, your employees. We, we've done work with casinos, so it's more of a public announcement. So you have members of the public in your casino that need to evacuate uh, versus uh, uh, on the enterprise side where it's, it's more about employees and, and, and alerting them to, uh, to evacuate. Um, you know, on the broadcast side, uh, the, the communication systems are usually more critical. You, you know, if, if um, on the AV side, if somebody's conference room projector goes out, uh, business is not going to stop. But if a broadcaster where the show is, uh, is the main uh, source of revenue, uh, you want everything, you know, uh, dual redundant, triple redundant, quadruple redundant. Um, uh, I, an example that comes to mind is the Super Bowl in 2013 where they, they lost uh, uh, part of the lighting uh, due to an electrical outage in, in the stadium. And, um, you know, the, the game had to be halted. The, the field wasn't properly lit. Uh, the broadcasters lost, uh, I think they had only one camera on. So um, that was a major disaster. And, you know, the question was if, if the, a, 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 re, a faulty relay, I believe, was blamed on that. So, uh, you know, the electric company pointed at the stadium owner for doing something wrong. The stadium pointed at the local power authority. Well, why did you put the wrong relay in or a faulty relay? But someone should have had backup generators. You know, there should have been a vent power. Uh, I mean, you know this, Brock. I, I, I'm sure you have uh, Caterpillar or somebody with with uh, uh, multiple uh, trucks and uh, trucks. Yeah, exactly. Generators need to be there, and you know, you would think that would be out of the purview of the of the broadcaster. But you, if you don't have any electricity, you're going to be knocked off the air. So, um, I always ask my customers, how important is this? television transmission or a bit ovation, we move video from point A to point B. So are you the primary rights holder? If this video goes down for three minutes, what is that gonna cost you? Well, we're charging uh, $4 million per minute for advertising. So I guess if we go down for four minutes, that's uh, $8 million. So uh, uh, then maybe dual, triple, quadruple redundancy on all aspects, power, connectivity, communications, even personnel, you know, makes sense. Absolutely. Cassie, from, from your standpoint, what you've seen, you know, um, what are area, ways that we can encourage customers if they're not even thinking about, like, like Jim said, the redundancy, uh, whether that's power or that's transmission or that's wireless, whatever it is, the, the wisdom of redundant system. You know, I, I don't know if it's, yes, that's a huge point. Um, is it's, all about being prepared right and we prepare ourselves in so many other regards um, in the case that something would happen but I don't think we train and instruct on what to do from an AV standpoint in this scenario as much as we should we talk about system security we talk about security from an IT perspective so how do we 
um, make sure that our, our devices are encrypted, for example, but we don't talk about actual physical security. And when we're talking about natural disasters, what is the backup plan? And something that we do have is we have standards. There are standards in place um, with this in mind and this type of consideration, but nobody really knows about them. So how do we train on standardization? So when you have a natural disaster or you have an outage at you know, a main sport facility, um, what is the protocol? What do you do? And how do you relay that message to everybody else? Um, is it equipping these emergency response teams with better AV systems so they can better respond. You know, you're talking about communication. All of a sudden you lose the ability for loved ones to communicate back and forth when something like the Bahamas happens and an entire island is out and they send emergency response teams in. But the big thing is to make sure that these people can then better communicate with the loved ones on a different island or back on the mainland, for example. Um, so I think from our perspective, it's, it's where, how do you A, develop that type of system um, from a manufacturing standpoint, how do we make sure that we're, we're fail proof in that environment? Uh, and then how do you standardize it properly? And is that going through a larger organization or, or creating a standard practice for AV? And then how do you deliver it and how do you train on it? Um, so I think those are weak points for us right now in all frankness, and it's something to consider. Um, certainly, obviously natural disasters, but in live performance, something like the stadium losing power, what is that backup plan? So it comes back to education, I think, and standardization. Very good. All right, our next up, uh, our story comes to us from our friends over at AV Magazine. Uh, a London-based startup is focusing on standardized rooms. Co-founders Chris Spence and Chris Gore uh, are looking at, honestly, creating these, these simple, not, not simplified systems, but very uh, standard systems that look at um, conferences and collaboration solutions, deploying them quickly. But it's a, it's a one size fits all type approach. Uh, Jim, I want to start with you on this. When, when it comes to getting into, whether it's, it's unified communications or it's broadcast or it's you know, a general conference room, what's the wisdom behind you know, a, a standard um, out of the box, one size fits all versus a bespoke system? Well, most of our customers have unique needs. Uh, typically, when we, we engage with a customer, our biz development department will, will ask some, some qualifying questions of the customer. And then uh, uh, once a project seems real, that the customer has a budget to do this project, we'll do an engineering discovery call. Uh, most of our systems are, are standards-based and uh, uh, we try to build systems that are open in architecture. Uh, I think a lot of the standards uh, in our industry uh, or, or in, in video and television in general, uh, broadcast has always been standards based, you know, and, and I think maybe in the early days of AV, uh, it was a little bit more of the Wild West, you know, getting one vendor's gear to communicate properly with another vendor's gear was more of a challenge and, and an art. And, you know, you kind of had to design the whole room around one vendor just because of interoperability problems. So, so uh, technical standards are, are uh, you know, I, I'm an engineer at, at my core, so I, I love standards. I love rules. You know, we, we love that, you know, we love structure. Um, but, you know, I, I think not every customer has a budget for a customized system. So if there's kind of a, a standard, you know, here's your typical conference room with a, with a display or a projector and, and a certain type of, uh, you know, Crestron or AMX control and, and a certain type of uh, uh, communication systems, phone systems, et cetera. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. And, and you know, it, at least it's a starting point. Then if a customer wants to, wants to customize from there, uh, it g gives a starting point. I imagine the costs would be well defined as well if it's if it's a standard configuration or a standard uh, footprint. Um, so I don't know if that's the, yeah. the, the answer you were looking for. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Maybe Brock can elaborate a little bit. Hmm. Cassie, real quickly, uh, before Cassie worked for sure, she worked for an integrator uh, here in St. Louis as an engineer. Talk for a second because the the the, the two gentlemen here talk about time wasted on bespoke. Yeah right 
talk about that for a second. Is, is that really, in your opinion, time wasted or is there some value there in, in spending some extra time maybe on a, on a base system that then you can augment with some additional time engineering to make it fit more uh, a client's needs? Yes, so design time, you're cutting down significantly on implementation, right? Because every time you engage your engineer, it's 90 to $120 an hour to have them custom design, build a space. If you as a salesperson need that AB technical balance, you can't do it. Um, so if you have a base standard, I think it cuts down on that time. And from a sales perspective, it's great. However, it needs to be scalable. You need to make sure that whatever that design is, it's scalable to the specific needs of that customer. So as a salesperson or an engineer, hopefully you'll just have to come in and make it custom to a point um, to make it scalable based on size of the space, whatever that might be. Uh, and then the biggest point I think for us now, as we're seeing more of those standard rooms is tagging on that service right? That service is really the big point of this. It should be a base standard room, scalable, you, you use the same concept with preferred vendors every time around, so you're not guessing what you have to use, what products you have to use, if they speak together, if they work, if it's an open API. You're not taking into consideration all those facts because you know it does. It's, it's the standard. However, what your real value is moving forward as a trader is hopefully tapping on that service agreement on that service clause, and you're following up with them with firmware updates every, you know, three months or whatever it might be, but that's really the value add. So I think standardizing on design is great. Pick those preferred vendors, hopefully a handful, so you're not guessing if, if products work together well, if they have open APIs or not. Um, and then it's scalable and tack on the service agreement at the end of the day. Also, as, as, as a former programmer, you can also uh, reuse a lot of code if, if you have to. Yeah. I mean, and that's what it should be, is being able to create that as much as possible, but also make it scalable so it's more specific to the customer. Uh, Brock, uh, same kind of question to you. What what is the value of bespoke versus versus you know the, these these standard based rooms that are kind of one? Uh, so these guys at Spore, I think that's how you. I don't know if it's S P O R uh, or Spore A V. Um, I think they are brilliant. So they're solving the problem of time. Um, if you uh, go on their website, and I uh, encourage people to do so, there's a room configurator, and it asks you what you want to do with the room, and then it, it uh, uh, asks you what the size of the room is. Is it four to eight people? Is it eight to ten people? Um, and uh, then it asks what size display you'd like, 55-inch, 65-inch, 75-inch. You click the button, and it gives you a system. And that system has a price on it. And it doesn't matter where in the UK they're delivering it. That's what the price is. They don't tell you the brand name of anything. They tell you uh, that it does soft conferencing um, with whatever soft conference client. You plug in here. It works every time. You don't need any third-party control. And they can buy that system. Uh, You can buy that system today and have it delivered next week or the week after. That's the problem that, that this uh, company is solving. Rapid deployment, rapid delivery, um, the, uh, because to the consumer, uh, the meeting room user, the brands mean nothing. Sorry about that, uh, Cassie. Um, okay, the, um, but the brands don't mean anything. And it doesn't really matter if it's an LG TV or an NEC TV or a Samsung TV. That oh. matters to us but it doesn't matter to them. And, uh, uh, and so I hope David Danto listens to this because he and I have been deb- debating um, customized systems versus standardized systems, plug and play uh, for probably a decade now within the industry. And I've always been with Cassie. You gotta go with custom because it's gotta fit exactly what the customer's requirements are and the room and it has to be supported and every customer is different. And the reality is, is that uh, Sonos pretty much goes in every house uh, and works well in every house and doesn't need to be customized and delivers a good enough experience and that's what these folks at Spore are doing. They're delivering a good enough uh, meeting experience. They're doing it quickly and they're probably doing it cost effectively. Brock, can I ask you a question about that really quick? Um, 
So are they selling this as managed services from the standpoint of they technically own the gear, but this is a five-year contract with the customer? Or uh, are they and everything. No, no, it's uh, it's a room in a box. The room that I looked at was 8,395 pounds delivered and installed. So where's the value add? Do they also, goes back to service agreement, are they selling type, some type of service clause so they're still engaged with customer or is it a, here yeah. you go, I'm done, on to the next? So I use Starbucks K-Cups uh, for my coffee in the morning. I can buy them at my local supermarket or I can buy them from Amazon. Uh, and Amazon is pretty much the same price as my local supermarket. Amazon delivers them to me every month. Um, and the value add for these folks is delivery. They don't, uh, this is an IT manager, stereotypically. Uh, she or he is uh, looking to service their clients within the enterprise. They're told they need a soft conferencing meeting room because what they have now um, can I say sucks on this show, Tim? Uh, what they have now sucks. And, uh, and uh, so they look online, they find a solution. This looks great. It looks like a reliable package from a, a dependable company. I'm going to buy one and it's going to show up at the loading dock and then I can move this off of my to-do list and, uh, and move on with my life. So it's not installed. They don't. Uh, no, no. They they'll install it. They'll send an installer, and then. Sure. But the Cassie's point is there some sort of a service agreement? You know, six months in, the thing stops working. You know, is there a, a support and service is a big element of our business. Right. Um, um, uh, you know, our IPTV system. Somebody they need to change their channel lineup. They. Uh, it, it's usually it's usually not a technical problem. It's usually like a user preference change, that kind of thing. So who, who supports that? Is that, is that so, so these, I, I, I don't know because I haven't gone that deep into what their service offering is. It's certainly something that uh, we at Westbury focus on as well. Um, but generally, simple systems, this is, this is not a lot different than the system that I have in, in my living room. Um, this doesn't need a lot of support. Right? These are these are basic systems. This system costs, I don't know, in, in US dollars, maybe it's $10,000. Uh, and there are a lot of five and $10,000 rooms and they're being purchased. Zoom rooms are being purchased mm -hmm. by uh, customers with a parts list. And, um, and pretty much anybody can put those things together with the exception, perhaps, of hanging a display on a wall. Um, there, there is a customer segment that's gonna buy this. Uh, it, because it's fast and because it's simple. Is it tailored to their exact requirements and their software and their room? Um, no, uh, fortunately, for those of us in the systems integration business, there are still lots of those rooms available. But I wanna sell these rooms too, because these rooms solve a problem for a specific mm -hmm. kind of customer. Uh, the stock is on the shelf. They're buying their TVs by the 50s instead of the ones. They're not having to wait for somebody to deliver. It's all kitted out. Um, and uh, pretty much uh, uh, Geek Squad can go and, uh, and install this. There's no rocket science. There's no CTS required. There's no code. It just works. I almost feel like that's concerning to the the integrators, to national integrators, to any integrator, because you're taking away the need for one, essentially. And you're saying, hey, now work with an IT consultant on the side who's going to do your firmware updates or manage your system or, you know, provide you analytics and reporting on the usage. Yeah, that IT consultant is now going to make a ton of money, but there's no need for the integrator if, if somebody can go in and install it until we get a call from a manufacturer perspective saying, my system's optimal. Now I'm going to sit with X, Y, and Z products. Can you help me? And we have to sort them through somebody. Um, but also as a manufacturer, uh, we find the value in making sure products are approved to buy. And they have to go through training. Even if the product is as simple as plopping it into a room, a table, whatever, and it's up and running, we still make that product approved to buy. So we're keeping the channel condensed down to integrators um, where we've worked with in the past or, or that we, we know are capable of, of integrating that entire system. It would be more cost beneficial to us to make it, you know, an Amazon product. 
and say anybody can go online and buy any of our products, uh, certainly, but we do, we do see the importance of still utilizing the channel. So I, I'd be a little, I'm a little, I think it's a great structure for certain applications. I'm a little concerned by that. If our industry is truly moving in the direction of adapting to that, it's kind of concerning to me. Um, I, I think the mics on the desk that they're selling might be MX396s. Um, and by the way, those are available on Amazon. Uh, uh, but uh, an MXA is a, you know, is a different that requires some expertise. Um, you know, especially now you can't hang it from a ceiling. So, <laughs> sorry. Too soon. I had to go there. The, uh, we crossed over into Jim's world and we actually suspended uh, uh, MXA 910s over the Toronto Raptors basketball court. Yes, to, prov a great uh, uh, to provide uh, better audio into the club suite. So this is on-court audio, every profanity, every grunt, every slap um, at, uh, uh, at um, considerable volume uh into uh into the money suites and awesome. it's and it's spectacular so uh, that is um, truly awesome thank you that's amazing it, it 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 is truly awesome so um i'll i'll just close the loop you said you know this must be of concern to integrators of course it scares the living daylights out of us um because that's not the way that we've always done business and uh, um and so what we need to do is change the way that we do business so that we can meet, uh, if we want to meet this particular customer types mm -hmm. requirements. So it's probably more SMB uh, or more uh, local regional government as opposed to national, uh, more SMB than, uh, than enterprise because the enterprise who's you know, rolling out 400 rooms a month, they just want somebody to take care of it. Somebody else take care of it, um, and and they've got the money. They're spending somebody else's money, get it off their desk. Um, but if I've got eight rooms, uh, I'm running a, an accounting firm or a legal firm. I need places to do soft conferencing, um, and I don't want to have to sit through a sales pitch from an AV integrator whose language I don't understand. Good point. Uh, and and you know is talking to me about. AVB and AEC and Dante and HDMI and and AV over IP. It's like no 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 no. I want a conference room. I want to make a presentation. What do I need? Give me something. So most integrators have standardized systems in their bag already. Uh, I believe, including uh, your former employer, is CTI, correct? Um, and so there's a. Um, uh, you know, they have some specific and, and this is to help their customers make fast and easy choices, uh, reuse the same code. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, our, our IPTV systems, we, we, we have modules, you know, you don't have to buy the digital signage module, but it's a, it's right. a line item software that you add and, and we activate it with a license and, you know, so there are, there are cookie color cutter elements to our system. Um, but but then there is always a, a customizable uh, element to it as well. Yeah. Is right. that a seg segue into the next topic, Tim? It actually is not. That's a segue into uh, thanking you guys so much. Uh, we've had a very good conversation. Uh, we, 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 we pushed up against our time here. Uh, we will put a link to our, our last article, which was a fascinating conversation uh, from our friends over at SCN about the future of AV and some really smart people that I want you to take a listen and watch so go check out that video as well so thank you all so much mr brock mcginnis how do people find you or westbury um i'm at brock mcginnis on twitter uh, occasionally prolific um and uh, westbury.com uh based in uh, a rainy toronto this afternoon oh, sorry to hear that. uh cassie Berger from sure thank you ma'am thank you appreciate it and uh you can find me on linkedin Cassie Berger, E-R-G-E-R, -E um, and then check out our webpage, sure.com. We have some great articles on there, updates to products, everything you, can, everything you need. And uh, Jim Jaquetta, thank you, sir, uh, from Bitovation. Yeah, you can find me on social media, Jim Jaquetta. My name's pretty unique, uh, J-A-C-H-E-T-T-A. -T -T and you can learn more about Vidovation at vidovation.com. That's V-I-D-O-V-A-T-I-O-N.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for, me, for me, for Aviation Nation, uh, 
don't follow me on the Twitters because this is the Friday after the Thursday night Bears game, which, which, yeah, anyhow, that was <laughs> uh, if you're a Bears fan, uh, go by the website avnation.tv. That's avnation.tv. You'll find this program and a host of others. Good Lord, do we have a whole lot of things coming down the pipeline. Uh, this is going to post on Monday. If you would do me a huge favor, check out the website on Tuesday. We have a brand new show coming down the pipeline that I'm really, really passionate about. It's taken about three to four months of, of editing and swearing and, and doing all those other stuff. We're sitting down with some CEOs. Uh, we're calling it the executive chair. It's a half an hour-ish um, with these folks. And, and we're, we're, we're getting into some nitty-gritty, getting into some you know, how to get things done, some, some, some personal uh, triumphs and failures of theirs. So check that out. It comes out this Tuesday. Uh, it's called the executive chair. Uh, also, while you're there, uh, we also are heading to Cedia this week. Matt Scott, Rich Fragoza, and myself are, are heading out to Denver to cover everything residential in the world of AV. So check all that stuff out and more. Uh, also check out our supporter section. These are the folks who help us financially, help us bring you AV Week and Resi Week and CD and all that more. And uh, sure is one of those. We thank them their support. So all that and more at avianation.tv. 